I really think that humanity is, at the minute, poised to become a truly interstellar species. We have, we've seen the excitement of Apollo, but that was very much a one-shot deal. When we went to the moon, we took an enormous rocket there, and we only brought back a small capsule with three people inside it. Since that time, we've concentrated on developing things in low Earth orbit. Indeed, I'm going to suggest that the fabric of space activity is really woven into our society. But now, space agencies, private enterprise, even individual entrepreneurs are starting to look at permanent long-term space settlements. Now, the tech and the engineering achievement alone is breathtaking when you think about what's required to get us there. But what I'm going to ask is, as a lawyer and somebody who is interested in the constitutions and interested in the underpinning ethics of what makes society tick, there are some pretty fundamental questions that I think we need to ask ourselves. What type of footprint do we want humanity to leave when it becomes a spacefaring civilization? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to outline a problem that I see happening in Earth orbit. I'm going to point to how we're trying to deal with that problem. And then I'm going to try and flag up some of the ways in which we can solve it. I'm going to pose questions. I have no answer to this. But I hope you, sitting there, will take these questions away. We'll think about them. We'll inform policy makers. We'll inform scientists. We'll inform mission planners. Because by that method of communication, by reaching out, we, each one of us, can have a say in what humanity looks like in outer space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through one of the key problems that we are facing in the space environment at the minute. And I'm going to do it by the means of an exciting economic parable. Garrett Hardin was an economist, and he posed the tragedy of the commons. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to imagine a very large, not an infinitely large, but a very large area. And it's got lovely, lush grass, really nice, really green, ideal for grazing. Now, for this bit, I'm going to need some volunteers. Now, sorry, I've got them up here. There are my volunteers. I wanted real sheep, but apparently I couldn't have them. There's something to do with the rules of being here. I don't know. So a lovely, large grazing area. Not an infinite one, but a very, very big one. So I'm going to take my sheep, and I'm going to graze it there. And the sheep's going to eat this lovely grass. The grass won't grow back, but that's all right, because it's a very, very large area, and it's only one sheep, right? Then the next day, we're going to get another sheep. Somebody's going to join me, and we're going to have two sheep. You can see where the parable's going, can't you? One sheep, two sheep, that's fine. But what happens when it's 1,000? What happens when it's 100,000? What happens when it's 100 million? Eventually, after a limited impact, it's going to then go to be a large cumulative impact. And it's going to overwhelm the supply of even this large common land. So let's transpose it to space. Initially, space activity was restricted to two superpowers. In, in, in order to go into space, you had to have a superpower budget, and one rocket sent up one satellite. And it was perfectly lawful to do this. I'm going to talk about the law and the way in which space is regulated in a minute. But eventually, when others start launching their rockets, when private companies start launching their rockets, when entrepreneurs start launching their rockets, eventually the availability of orbital positions, especially if we're not pulling satellites down that no longer work, eventually the supply will overwhelm even the biggest natural resource we have. At the minute, humans have sent up approximately 5,000 satellites. Okay? Of them, approximately 2,000 are still working. So there's more up there that are non-functional, or there's more that have been sent up there that are non-functional, that are functional. 
But it's not just the satellites that cause the problem. What we have is a whole range of waste in space. You can see there are rocket bodies, there's fairings that make up the spacecraft. There's astronauts' gloves, there's screwdrivers, all hurtling around at about 17,500 miles an hour. That's enough to make a mess of any number of satellites. And you can see how they're affecting the different orbits of the Earth, all traveling at speeds that can have a cataclysmic effect on satellites. So what's the problem? Well, if we think about the context of space exploration right now, 2019, it's gone through a change, it's gone through a generational shift from this Cold War, from this binary architecture, where superpowers were using it effectively as an extension of the foreign policy. It's moved on very much into a commercial field. Sure, there is still a military element to space. But now, as I say, we've got private companies that specialize in space activity. We've got countries realizing that actually their critical national infrastructure is dependent on space. And also, we've got rockets increasing their payload capacity. The record for rocket launches, I think it was 1967, where there were over 130 rocket launches, but generally it was one rocket, one object. Last year, there was, I think, around 111, 115, something like that. But nearly 400 objects went into space. The number of launches is staying relatively consistent, but the number of objects increasing the orbital population is going up dramatically. We're putting more stuff up there. And that is only going to increase. We have developments in what we call constellation technologies, groups of very small satellites working together as a constellation. But they're individual space objects capable of collision with other space objects. Access to space is getting cheaper, it's getting more plentiful than it has ever been. We've seen the marches and the incredible advancements in reusability. It's only going to get cheaper. So how do, we how do we avoid this tragedy of commons occurring in space? We've got 60 years of human activity. All of the debris and the detritus of human activity in space, coupled with active satellites doing the job that we need them to do, forming our infrastructure. Now in 1978, a NASA scientist, Dr. Donald Kessler, recognized that there may be a point where the number of satellites overwhelms the Earth's ability to deal with them. And we have collisions. These collisions form a cascade reaction, and eventually you get created a debris belt, which renders the orbit unusable and may actually serve to restrict access above that orbit. We could become prisoners. But on the other hand, Space activity is increasing. Commercial activity in space is increasing. Military activity in space is increasing. How do we ensure sustainable access to space whilst avoiding the tragedy of the commons and possible Kessler effects? So, I'm a space lawyer. You would think my approach is going to recommend the law. And it is to an extent. But the law isn't the only mechanism. And that's where you're going to come in. I'm going to tell you what the law is, because there is law in outer space. One of the great things about the Cold War is that it did produce what we like to call the central trunk of space law, the Outer Space Treaty, 1967. And it laid down a series of accepted behaviors. It's actually probably more like a... a, a a statement of beliefs, a statement of how we should do business in space. It's binding on over a hundred states, so it's fairly well accepted. And what it does is it imposes conditions. It imposes conditions on states using space. Start off by saying states are free to use space for peaceful purposes. But it puts a limitation on that. It says 
States can't appropriate space. So, in answer to the question that you may see posed, who owns the moon? I'm going to tell you. I do. And you do. And you do. And you do. We all do. It's communal. Res communis. It cannot be the property of any one state. And the Outer Space Treaty goes on and develops these ideas. There can be no nuclear weapons in outer space. Astronauts are envoys of mankind. States are responsible for supervising space activity. And if something goes wrong with one of their space objects, states are liable for the damage caused. But, and here's a little sort of old law lecturer's trick. What I tell my students is, if ever you really want to understand the law, or if there's a piece of legislation or a treaty that you're looking at and you really want to get behind it, and really want to see what it's about, look at the year. The year will tell you a lot about the creation of a piece of legislation. 1967. That tells us all about the geopolitical circumstances. Humans were going to the moon, but humans didn't know which branch of humanity was going to get there. So they had to create, effectively, a security treaty designed to stop the Cold War spilling out into space. And of course, 1967, I think it's fair to say, environmentalism hadn't gone mainstream. So what you had was a security treaty without any real concept of environmentalism. So there's only so much that the law can do because it's a creature of its time. What I want to do now is raise some of these environmental challenges that, that we as humans are going to face when we go out there. Yes, we've got Earth orbital debris to deal with. We've got the risk of the Kessler syndrome. But don't forget, if we are going to become a spacefaring species, we're going to need orbital infrastructure around other celestial bodies. We know of the problems regarding orbital debris. Do we want to replicate them in orbit around other planets as well? Or is there something we can put in place to stop that happening? One of the big venture capital experiments that we're seeing in space is mining companies. Companies promising to bring back lucrative riches from asteroids and from celestial bodies. Well, as we know, mining is not environmentally neutral. It leaves its signature. Are we going to have to put in place laws and regulations governing how we interact with these celestial bodies? When we go to an alien planet, when we even put a probe on an alien planet, there is a sincere risk that we can contaminate it with pathogens and microbes from Earth. One, a former um, planetary scientist from the NASA Planetary Protection Office said, if you really want to detect life on Mars, one of the easiest ways is to bring it from Florida. So how do we manage that? Similarly, one of the staples of science fictions is the space plague. We're seeing a lot of sample return missions. That's missions that are going to other celestial bodies to bring material back to Earth. How do we protect the Earth from that? I think there's a danger of replicating poor behavior that we, that we see on Earth, but of also repeating the mistakes of piecemeal regulations, not looking at human space activity as a holistic exercise. Current space law, as I've said, doesn't mention environmental protection. But what we have seen in recent years, if international treaties are kind of falling out of favor, what we're seeing is a rise in what we would call soft law mechanisms, guidelines that nudge and persuade, that don't punish, but incentivize. So for example, the United Nations in 2007 promulgated the debris mitigation guidelines. No force in law, but they're recommended good practice. And what do you know? Industry and states and academia have started to follow those guidelines because they want to be responsible. The vast majority of space operators want to be responsible. The planetary guidelines by the Committee on Space Research, avoiding forward and backward contamination that I talked about earlier, have again been broadly accepted. Yes, they might need refining, 
but they are accepted and they are nudging the behavior of space actors. I'm a great believer in the power of guidelines and codes of conduct. Let's look at this room. There's no law that compels you to sit in your seat. You could stand up and give me a song from the show if you want. I've done this a few times, right, and I'm still waiting for someone to do it. <laughs> but you don't, because that's the group working together. There's a guideline, there's a code of conduct. These things can be powerful. There are, however, no guidelines on active debris removal. We've talked about, or I've mentioned mitigation. Yeah, new stopping new stuff going up there and causing debris. But like I say, there's still a lot of satellites up there. Active debris removal is one of the things we need to start doing. States need to start thinking about this. Mission planners need to start thinking about this. And to be fair, they are. When you go away from this talk, have a look at some of the work that's going on. Some of the companies out there, some of the states out there, they're looking into this. Have a voice in this. As architects of tomorrow, we should be contributing to this discussion. And then we think about the broader questions. We already, in the news, see people talking about Mars colonies and lunar villages. What's going to be the rule of law like on there? What values are we going to hold sacred on there? What is the ethical footprint? What is the philosophical footprint of humanity going to look like? So how do we avoid this tragedy of the commons, not only in Earth orbit, but in any orbit, wherever humans are? Well, there is a pessimistic point which says getting agreement is difficult. We know that. Legal framework doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. But I do think guidelines, codes of conduct, normative behavior can be used to nudge space actors in the right direction. We must deal with low Earth orbit, but we must always have one eye beyond that. And we must recognize that space now has a range of new actors involved. It's not just two superpowers, it's private companies. It's, you know, other nations who would never have got involved before. I'm going to finish off by posing you a challenge, by posing you the questions that I want the answers to, that humanity will need the answers to. What are going to be our shared values as we go out there? How can we make the laws that reflect those values? And how can we engage in activity that is sustainable and satisfies the needs of the present, but not at the expense of future generations? Those, I think, are the real questions we need to address. Thank you.